whatever you do, do not skip ahead of this bit as I have some really exciting things to announce slash remind you about before we get into this week's episode of Last Orders. First of all, we're back with another live show at this year's Battle of Ideas Festival. We did one last year, as many of you will know, and it was such a roaring success that our friends over at BOI Towers have put us in a much bigger room this year, which means that you really have to come along. If you've never been, the Battle of Ideas is the UK's premier festival of debate and ideas, taking place this year on Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th of October in Westminster, Myself and Chris and all your favourite Spikes writers will be speaking across the weekend. But most importantly, you can come along and see our pod live. It's on Saturday the 19th of October at 12.15pm in the Robert Runcie room. Do not miss it and why would you? Because as a Last Orders listener, you can get 20% off your ticket. To get your cut price tickets, either for the Saturday or for the whole weekend, go to battleofideas.org.uk and use the discount code SPIKED24 at checkout. That's battleofideas.org.uk and use the discount code SPIKED24, S-P-I-K-E-D-2-4. We'll also post a link in the show notes that will take you straight there. Do come along. It was bags of fun last year, and we've got three top, top guests signed up for this year's show in the form of Julia Hartley Brewer, Simon Evans, and Kate Andrews. Finally, as Spiked readers will know by now, we're also very excited to have just released our latest Spiked book by Brendan O'Neill. It's called After the Pogrom, the 7th of October, Israel and the Crisis of Civilization. It documents in startling detail Hamas's pogrom in Israel almost a year ago now and the disturbing response it sparked among the Western intelligentsia. The book is brilliant, a real call to arms for civilization and against the new anti-Semitism. You can buy it right now on Amazon, or if you want a copy signed by Brendan himself, we're giving those away exclusively to anyone who donates £50 or more to Spiked while stocks last. To do that, just go to spiked-online.com slash donate. That's spiked-online.com slash donate. Thanks so much. See you all at the Battle of Ideas, and let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome back to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater, editor of Spiked, joined as I am in every episode by my co-host Chris Snowden. How are you doing, Chris? And also about Tom, thanks, and hello, listeners. Hello, listeners, and also a big hello to Josie Appleton, who is our very special guest today. Josie is the director of the Civil Liberties Campaign Group, the Manifesto Club, and also a long-time writer for Spiked. How are you doing, Josie? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. So to kick things off, I thought we'd talk about what Chris Whitty is up to. Um, Chris, you wrote a piece in the Spectator this week, picking up on something which came out of Labour conference where you had the new public health minister, Andrew Gwynn, saying that the government may even be looking at licensing laws for alcohol as part of a kind of broader push to make the country healthier and crack down on preventative health issues and so on. But you've you've seen the kind of hidden hand of Chris Whitty in all of this and the general war on alcohol and cigarettes that we've seen in recent weeks. Do you want to tell us a bit more about this? Yeah. Um, his name keeps cropping up as the man behind the scenes who is behind all of this stuff, going back to Rishi Sunak's tobacco prohibition scheme, which the Labour is obviously going to not only introduce, but probably add some bells and whistles to. Whitty was heavily rumoured to have talked Sunak into this. There didn't seem to be any other reason for it, because it just came so completely out of the blue. It wasn't something that Sunak ever really mentioned before, or anybody else really. Um, and then... Witty was all over the TV screens, which he hasn't been much since COVID. But he did the media rounds promoting this idea and seemed quite fervent about it. He'd previously gone on about how he wants to abolish the tobacco industry and this kind of thing. Fairly standard stuff for people in public health, but he has a lot of a lot of influence still. He obviously got a lot of political influence during COVID and he has maintained that, even though he's not doing the daily briefings, he's still pretty active behind the scenes. He also seems to be the inspiration for this outdoor smoking ban and this talk about restricting licensing hours in the on-trade or the off-trade, whatever it is Gwyn's thinking of doing. It all comes back to this um, idea that the NHS is going to collapse unless people lead healthier lifestyles. And Gwyn at this meeting specifically said that he'd had a meeting with Chris Whitty on his first day in the job and Whitty had shown him some slides. I see that. Which he communicates entirely through the medium of slides. Even with members of his own family, I'm sure. <laughs> he brought, yeah, he brought a projector along with him and, and showed him. The first slide basically said that 40% of NHS spending goes on 
treating preventable diseases, which I, I do not believe to be true, unless you, think, you know, define preventable diseases extremely broadly. And he says in 15 years' time, this is going to go up to 60%, and the clear implication is that the government must you know, prevent these diseases. And the only thing the government can think of is to clamp down on food and uh, smoking and, um, and booze. Uh, and if you look at what people like Starmer and Streeting have been saying over the last few months, about the NHS and about prevention, it all very much fits in with this. I'm quite sure that Witty has given a similar presentation to both those people and many others and, and Sunak and, and so on down the, down the line. So, yeah, I do see the sinister hand of Sir Professor Christopher Witty in this. And um, I don't know, I would like him to be a bit more accountable, perhaps, <laughs> or to, for his views to be challenged, because what he's saying about the economics of the NHS is just completely wrong as we've discussed many times on, on, on the podcast, I'm sure, um, you know, preventive health, generally speaking, increases healthcare costs in the long term. It, it doesn't reduce them. But if he's got all these politicians spellbound by this idea that somehow you can, you know, you can reduce the NHS budget by 40% if people just put down their pints and the pubs close at 10 o'clock and, you know, 19-year-olds aren't allowed to buy cigarettes, <laughs> aside from the fact that these policies aren't going to prevent anything, um, we're just going to be on this runaway train of endlessly attacking people's liberties to do things they enjoy in order to protect the NHS. Where have we heard that before? And what do you make of all this, Josie, the increasing role that Chris Whitty seems to have in policy making? Yeah, he probably doesn't want to surrender the power that he had during COVID. And I think it's very indicative of the way in which kind of pseudo kind of science, I mean, it, a lot of the statistics in COVID were complete junk too, right? It, it's almost just like you give it a scientific form and that becomes the justification for political action. And I think that in a way the scientists are now the kind of Rasputin of our age in the sense that they're the ones kind of giving the secret, quite mystical advice really in many ways. You know, if you just reduce the pint size then you're going to solve the health problem. And it's like, no, I mean, that's absurd, right? It's completely absurd. It's kind of mysticism that takes the form of a graph, kind of slightly plucked out of the air. And, you know, and I think that these kinds of people do have this kind of secret influence over politics. And a lot of people sort of see Neil Ferguson as a sort of evil manipulator. But I think the question is always the vulnerability of politics to being influenced and the attraction of politicians towards these kinds of people and these kinds of arguments. And I think in a way, like during COVID, the scientific advice became... Like the second chamber. And I think that they, they replace the public pressure and public influence. And, and the nature of these issues is also things that it almost like doesn't care what people think about them, because it's like, well, you're obviously making the wrong decisions. So what does it matter if you like it or not? You know, it's kind of, yeah. uh, you know, things like COVID and, and health, it's sort of like people are kind of objects for policy rather than subjects. So it's like, well, we don't really want to know if you think the pint size should change, because the question is, do you reduce or drinking by 10%? And that's going to have whatever whatever effect. So I think it's a sort of, it's almost becomes the new pressure on politicians and the new source of influence. But I mean, it's complete junk, everything they say, right? It's like, it's not science, you know, in any respect, as it says. It's just nonsense in terms of probably the biology of it, as well as the economics of it. But it just takes that, it's like scientism, it takes that form of a graph and a number. And so it kind of like looks kind of objective. But but anyone would look at that and say, that's, that's nonsense, like. <laughs> you just drink more, and it, and it has been it has been quite striking the sheer number, Chris, of sort of nanny state related announcements. Some of them have just been floated. Some of them have been more or less confirmed, like the outdoor smoking ban that we talked about a lot. Have you been surprised by how much nanny state stuff there's been? It feels like this government is behaving in a way that you would when you're right at the end of your term. You don't really know what you're for. You're sort of rudderless, and so you're thrashing around for a legacy, and so you pick these things off the shelf in a desperate attempt to do that. Why? Why is all this happening at the beginning? I guess why are they so into this nanny state stuff? Do you? Well, that's that's an interesting question because I think with Sunak, it clearly was a case of somebody thrashing around at the end of the government looking for a legacy, and it obviously isn't with these guys, um, which I think means that they genuinely believe it. I think they're probably not difficult to persuade by Chris Whitty because they probably like the sound of doing these things anyway. And there's a certain element of this government which is kind of let's, you know, it's kind of continuity Blairism. They'd like to pretend the last 14 years haven't happened and that everything was great under Blair and Brown and we're going to carry on doing the same thing. And these people consider the original smoking ban to be one of the great successes of that government. And so emulating it with the 
pro- prohibition or with the outdoor smoking ban kind of makes sense to them. But my concern is that they really do believe this, you know, um, because then there is no end to what they will do to us in order to try and save the NHS money. And Josie's right, it is complete junk. I mean, even if it was some truth to it, it I don't think it would justify just an endless encroachment of civil liberties. But it just isn't true. You know, I, I've worked out the figures. The official figures that the government uses, which are usually generated by, by pressure groups and are exaggerated. But if you add together the supposed cost in the NHS of drinking, smoking, and obesity combined, right? So the three massive killers, supposedly, the three things that are going to bring the NHS to their knees, it adds up to £12.5 billion a year which is a lot of money, but not in the scheme of the NHS budget and overall health spending. It is actually barely 4% of what we spent on healthcare last year, right? It's a tiny, tiny amount. Now, that's not to say that they're the only things that you know, cause preventable disease, but they're the only modifiable risk factors. You know, I'm sure that physical activity causes lots of supposedly preventable diseases, um, but the government can't do anything about that. You know, and a lot of things that are technically preventable, the government can't do or even try to do anything about. So we're looking at the three horsemen of the apocalypse, as Chris Whitty sees them, smoking, drinking, and obesity. If you eradicated them all, it would only save the NHS £12.5 billion. Pounds, and you'd lose well over £25 billion pounds in alcohol and tobacco revenue. So the economics of this is are this complete nonsense, as far as I can see. And there's economics... Uh, studies going back decades showing the same thing but they genuinely believe it and in a way that's more scary Mm -hmm. than having politicians who are just desperately scrabbling around for something to distract from a scandal or to secure a legacy absolutely and it, it does feel as if the public health blob even those who aren't directly informing policy have their tails up at the moment a little bit i mean in that story in the telegraph about maybe restricting licensing laws you had them really sounding off it's absolutely outrageous that you should be able to buy a bottle of vodka at a petrol station at two in the morning and also i wanted to talk about this um piece of research that came out of the behavior and health research unit at the university of cambridge mm. recommending that the pint of beer be cut by a third Um, They did the experiment with pubs serving the smaller portion sizes, found that it led to nearly 10% less beer being sold and consumed. They were surprised to find out that the pubs in question were not particularly happy about this. But there's also been this piece in The Guardian, which has really done the rounds by a journalist called L Hunt, just saying that it's time for British beer drinkers to admit that the two-thirds measure is infinitely preferable. Josie, what do you make of all this, not least from your perch in, in France, where maybe the pint is a confusing amount of alcohol for the locals? Yeah, I mean, I think I think maybe in some ways the attraction of the nanny state stuff now is because the regime's starting out decrepit. I mean, it's almost like starting out at the end. It doesn't have that burst of life that Blairism had or Cameron. And, but I mean, I think the the idea that you meddle with something like the pint, I mean, the point is every culture has its unit. I mean, Germans drink a litre, and it's when you go there, it's very big. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but it's good for banging on the table. Um, well, France, they're tiny. I mean, there's like a couple of sips, but you just have a lot. So the point is that every culture has its has its units, and the idea that you can just change behaviour by meddling with the units. And something like the pint is so such an icon. <laughs> so the idea you can just change this to change behaviour. I think they respect nothing, do they? They respect they don't respect any kind of cultural legacy or people's opinion or logic or whatever. It's like the idea that you can kind of meddle. You can drink an awful lot of very small bottles. I mean, I had some Airbnb people opposite me, and they. They literally filled my wheelie bin with bin bags of beer bottles within the course of three days. And they were really small bottles, but there were just like hundreds of them. <laughs> and you know, so it's, it's sort of, again, it's, it's kind of junk science, right? It's sort of this kind of mentality, almost alien-like mentality. It's like they're looking, coming down to look at people and to look at society as if they'd never heard of culture or a pub or they just look at people behaving. They call it behavior. Um, rather than, you know, a tradition or a culture or an action or a choice or something that involves a kind of human element of, of thought. And so it's just like there are these kind of alien scientist figures like move, trying to move us around like ants. And, and it doesn't work because people are not like that, right? They are cultural beings and, and they have their preferences. And they, one of those is like, how much do you want to drink? <laughs> and what, what feels like enough? And those sorts of units, I guess, the behavior modification. I mean, they must be so tied into the state, right? That's the other thing. A lot of academia now is just feeding, funded by the state and feeding into the state because that is not research that's, that's directed at anybody apart from government. 
you know, it's not like an objective discovery that about the way that alcohol reacts with the liver or, you know, it's not a kind of discovery about biological reality. It, and it can't be directed at anybody apart from government. Like it has no interest to anybody apart from government. So I think that's also interesting. That was obviously very visible in COVID is was these, and climate change as well, these vast swathes of pseudoscientific academia that are basically tied into the state, funded by the state and um, justifying behavior control policy. That's their mission. And that's their success in a way as well. It's like you get the hit if you get the, mm-hmm. the new law or whatever. I'm not sure. Influence. There is a kind of connection with Witty here as well, because the, um, the woman responsible for the study, which the Guardian article then kind of got some clickbait out of really, is Theresa Marteau, who was on SAGE. She was one of the supposed behavioral experts on SAGE who did such a terrific job. Mm. Along with Susan Mitchie and these people. Um, and she has been doing research into wine glasses and beer glasses and cutlery and plates for <laughs> about 20 years. I'd be surprised if we haven't mentioned it before. I'm sure we have. It's hilarious, really. But I mean, that's a, not even a main thing. That's the only thing, I think, that she actually <laughs> does research on. And it, she's always com- you know, contacting pubs in the Cambridgeshire area asking if they would like to take part in. <laughs> <laughs> in an opportunity to sell less alcohol. And obviously the vast majority of them say, no, we're not going to do that. And we don't want to be washing up smaller, you know, we, just from a pure efficiency point of view, whether or not you actually sell less alcohol, you don't want to be having to serve people more regularly and wash more glasses, right? Um, but she keeps doing this and she finds actually really equivocal results. And she's often quite disappointed to find that making this plate small hasn't made people eat less and uh, making this wine glass small hasn't made any difference. Um, and I couldn't even be bothered to read this latest study because honestly, it's about the 20th one she's done mm. it's kind of interesting maybe i don't know it could be a coincidence it's interesting that it's suddenly got a bit of pickup because generally speaking she just gets laughed at or ignored but now under the new government it suddenly became a bit of a thing at the guardian i don't know who was the woman who wrote this ridiculous article i mean i don't blame her it was they commissioned it because they knew it made people yeah angry. it was a it was a rage bait thing but um, i'd never come yeah. across a journalist before her name is l hunt one thing that also made me laugh. Is she american or something? She's I, not I, English, right? i'm not 100 sure but she does say that she came to the uk in 2017 and ever since yeah. then has been bemused by the size of the pint glass but which <laughs> yeah. again just seems designed to just enrage a certain <laughs> section of the audience you know yeah yeah i mean i would never be one to tell my to go back home but if you don't like the pint glass and you hate our country that much maybe <laughs> you should go somewhere else you know and also what's wrong with a half pint well, exactly it's so a choice right have, have, have yeah. half a pint um and yeah and you can't make pints smaller you know contrary to what, what headlines say <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a pretty strictly defined thing of the pint so yeah it's it's funny and it was rage bay but yeah, this woman was on Sage. So supposedly, she's one of, one of the best regarded scientists in the country, an expert on behavioural change, and a huge amount of taxpayers' money over the years has gone into this pathetic, ridiculous research. And there is no doubt that if she had the power, she would be you know, regulating the size of wine glasses and plates and beer, beer glasses. <laughs> and it's a reminder as well, I suppose, that. It seems to have become much more explicit now that the the end of these policies is not to deal with problematic drinking or behaviour at the extremes, but just across the board. Like if you're changing the measure of alcohol for absolutely everyone, or at least calling for it, then that's clearly not about what are we going to do about this small fraction of people who have a real problem, etc, etc. It's just everyone needs to start drinking less. And even in that silly rage bait piece, there was this kind of point about, now, of course, you know, people should be able to enjoy themselves, but I guess we are drinking too much. It's, it, it does feel like it's become more explicit now that um, mm. this is about everyone getting their act together rather than dealing with the, the negative consequences at the extreme, I suppose. 100%, yeah, they just ignore those people. It's all about the mm. whole the entire population. Because the entire population, you know, the, the, the average person or the, the worried well, or the moderate drinker, they're the people who might be affected by this kind of thing, in the same way as they were a little bit affected, some of them, by minimum pricing. But the heavy drinkers aren't. The heavy drinkers couldn't care less what size of pine glasses to drink. Of course they don't. Um, so, yeah, the people who are actually at risk of health harm, which is supposed to be the outcome we're interested in here, always get overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and as you said, it's also a reminder that these population-wide measures are... Um, or a bit of a con in that respect. But shall we, um, while we're talking about this whole area of labour, trying to basically take on that kind of mantle of new labour, another huge area in which our civil liberties were encroached upon under the 
the Blair administration's Josie was this whole area of kind of antisocial behaviour. This is something that you've been writing about for a very long time that the Manifesto Club have been campaigning on. And not only did we see the rise of the ASBO during the new Labour years, ever since then under successive Tory governments, we've seen a, a continuation of that, a kind of proliferation of these orders to crack down on certain forms of, of public behaviour, an array of different acronyms. And apparently the, the Keir Starmer government has its own coming down the pipe. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the respect order and what it may or may not constitute? Yeah, I mean, they've been talking about this for a year and a half. And everyone, I think, assumed that they had a plan for what this would be. But it turns out that they really don't. Um, so they've got the name, which is respect order. And they know it's going to do something tough. Like, if you infringe it, you're going to get arrested and potentially imprisoned. But aside from that, they, they don't seem to know. And the reason for that is because there's so many of these orders. I mean, the ASBO was the first uh, in 1998. But literally every year or two, there's a new order, probably every year or even more. Um, you know, there's orders for regulating knives, for regulating, you know, for closing your house, for banning you from certain areas, from dispersing you from certain areas. And so the, the orders that regulate, that have taken over from the ASBO um, are two, really, the Community Protection Notice and the Civil Injunction. And both of those are much easier to get, particularly the Community Protection Notice can be written out on the spot. And they can be very restrictive. I mean, they can ban you from your town centre, for example. And if you don't appeal that within 21 days, which most people don't, I mean, there's about 8,000 issued a year and maybe like 100 and 150 appeals. So very small number appealed. And then once you haven't appealed it, then that is your law, right? You cannot go in the town centre. And if you go in the town centre, it's a criminal offence, fine. And then you could get a criminal behaviour order to not go in the town centre. And if you go in the town centre, then you can get in prison for five years. So you have people who've been imprisoned for nothing more than going in the town centre or drinking in public, a lot of kind of street drinkers, that kind of thing. Or in one case, uh, there's a man who I've mean, been in touch with for a while who's, who was imprisoned for feeding the pigeons. And what do you make yeah, of all this, like Josie, the increasing legal orders. role that Chris Whitty seems to have in the birds, policy All he does is like, yeah, he probably does 70. It really helps him with grief and stuff. It's like very important to him. And, you know, but that's all he's done, ever done. All he's ever done is feed the birds. <laughs> he's... But he's had 10 legal orders, one spell of imprisonment, and now they're threatening him with another one of five years. And I think that really this, this kind of drive to produce a new order is some, it's kind of insatiable. And that's why they're having problems with, it, with respect to orders, because it's like, well, where do we put it? Like a civil injunction, or maybe it's a kind of amped up civil injunction. And who's it against? Like on one hand, they're saying, oh, it's kind of homeless people. We're going to keep them out of the town center. And then it's like, well... It's, it's kind of people doing graffiti or they don't really know. I mean, it's disrespectful people, but they can't have decided exactly who that is. So I think this kind of is almost like this takes the biscuit of the whole kind of order generation industry of just that kind of new order, new order, new order. And so they've got a new order, but they, it's like, well, where do we put it? What do we what does it do? We just know we need a new one. We know that much, but beyond that, they don't really know. So, so I think it, it is a kind of, it's really indicative of the new way of operating criminal justice. So the kind of classical way, which is kind of held, you know, pretty much since Mesopotamia, is you create a code which specifies a crime and a punishment. You know, so if you steal someone's cow or you kill them or beat them or whatever, then you get this punishment. That's a payment or a physical punishment. That's a kind of model, and that that's been the same really for all that time. And now they don't create crimes anymore, or hardly ever. You know, it, it's like they create a power to order you to stop doing something, the disobedience of which will be a crime. So they create a power for officials to give you a specific instruction on how to behave. And they kind of let, let them do what they want. I mean, they don't even monitor. Like most of these orders, they don't know how many have been issued. Like I've produced the national data on CPNs and PSPOs for the last 10 years. They do not care. Like the Home Office do not care how many have been issued. They don't care how people are using them, whether they're being used right or wrongly. or And they don't even, I said in the report, they don't even care. Like they're, they're, not, they're not interested. They're so not interested. And so they create these, these powers and it's like, and then they just wipe their hands of it. It's like, okay, you know, generate a new power and then go for it. Um, and I think this is kind of about showing that you're doing something without saying what that is. Because I think that it, it's kind of behavior control that's very different from, you know, like a religious state or something, which would say, you could only have your clothes this long, you can have to do this, you have to pray five times a day. Or you know, It's kind of behavior control that's very specific and very ideological. The point is they want to control behavior, but they have no ideology. They don't really know what they want you to do. And they don't really have any standards for 
how they want you to be behaving. So it's just a kind of uh, create a power for some official to do what they want, really. And looking at the kind of long history of these various orders, these various acronyms, I'm sure eagle-eyed listeners will realise that antisocial behaviour hasn't disappeared from the UK as a consequence of this plethora of new powers. Why is this such a... I mean, aside from the, the civil liberties point, which is, is clear and the kind of warping of the law and how it would usually operate, why is this such a sort of wrong-headed way of trying to deal with something like antisocial behaviour with these petty powers and infringements? I'm not sure I agree there is such thing as antisocial behaviour. Um, I mean, I think there is rudeness and disrespect and that sort of thing. That probably has got worse with the breakdown of communities. But when they talk about antisocial behaviour in government, you look at what they're talking about and it's like everything. It's like busking, for example, like busking without a license or busking in the wrong spot. That's antisocial behaviour. Or busking creates crime because there are pickpockets. Or It's like busking is social. It's sociable, right? You're creating um, an offering for the public. And But they talk about homelessness as antisocial behaviour. And it's like, well, that's poverty or alcoholism or whatever. Um, so I think the category of antisocial behaviour is not a logical category. It, it includes a whole bunch of things, which is basically anything the state wants to regulate or restrict or anybody who's disobeyed a specific order. So actually going into your town centre is not antisocial behaviour. I mean, that's just disobedience of an official order. So I think um, the category of antisocial behaviour is made up by the state to justify a broad range of restrictions in areas that are not really criminal. And it really means you've disobeyed an, disobeyed an official. That's what it really means when they say antisocial behaviour. I mean, there, there obviously is conduct. But I mean, I, I would say most serious conduct is, is criminal nuisance. I mean, there is a category of criminal nuisance. So somebody like the nightmare neighbours or whatever, like having house parties all night or every night, or, you know, if you've got a drug den next door, that's a criminal act, right, that's occurring. So I think... I think they actually just enforce statutory nuisance and the criminal law, then actually anything that's notable would be caught by that. I think the, the category of behaviour is a sort of, is a kind of pseudo category that's made up to justify these kind of criminalisation and intervention on a much lower kind of standard than before and in a much more fluid and um, open-ended way. But I mean, the, just the question of why it doesn't work, in almost every case, I think it makes it worse, like particularly neighbour relations. As soon as you kind of get one person issuing an order against the other, that's, you know, they're never going to talk again. And they start like putting up video cameras and keeping noise diaries. And they become obsessed with each other's noise, for example. If your neighbor was talking next door, then you wouldn't really notice, right? You, you think it's, oh, it's quite nice, or whatever. But, but once you've had this whole kind of antisocial behavior intervention, then you're like, that's so annoying. I can hardly, I can't <laughs> sleep or I'm stressed or it's, you know, it's triggered my anxiety or you know, people actually literally get in such a state about each other because of the antisocial behaviour intervention. And actually, you just kind of need to say, look, so you're not the best of friends, you just need to rub along. You just need to be a bit neighbourly and a bit of give and take. And the state does not need to mediate your neighbour relation. And once you start getting community protection notices and those sorts of things issued, it's like that neighbour relation is going to take up the police and the council hours of their time for something that's like, your leaves got, went on my drive. It's so petty. Your leaves went on my drive. You know, people banging on each other's walls. I mean, it's just, it creates a monster. So I would say enforce the criminal law and let society get on with the rest. And it may be that we need more neighbourliness. I think we do. Um, more community spirit, more helping each other out, being tolerant of each other. But that's for us to sort out, not the state. You know, I think there's a very small part. Max Weber said there's a very small part of social order that comes from the state and the criminal law. Most of social order is society ordering itself. And that's our job, not theirs. Chris, anything to add here? Any grievances you want to air against your own neighbours or before we... No, I'm fine with my neighbours at the moment. Um, I mean, I, I kind of disagree. It's very interesting what you say. And I, I don't like the sound of this arbitrary and capricious punishment. Um, I kind of disagree that governments don't make crimes anymore. They make crimes constantly. It's just a lot of the time they seem to be doubling down on things that are already crimes. And it sounds to me like these, these orders are... If the things like being drunk and disorderly are crimes, I don't see why you need something else to go on top of that. On Tuesday, um, a new crime came into effect, which was banning people carrying zombie knives. And on the very first day, somebody in Oxford was caught fighting with a zombie knife, which suggests that this is quite a widespread problem. But I'm pretty sure that carrying a knife was already a crime before this, right? You can, you can get 
in prison for walking around with a knife, as far as I as far as I recall. Were they banning the sale of them specifically? Was that the No, it was it's funny. The BBC said it was the possession of them. So I think this is just another one of many examples of the government banning things that are already banned. Um, I find it very hard to believe that the police need to have special orders to deal with things that are dangerous or so-called antisocial that are not, not already banned. Everything's bloody banned in this country. You can't, <laughs> you can't do anything. They must be able to find a law to clamp down on the people who are causing a nuisance. Everyone used to carry a knife. Everyone had a pocket knife, right? Yeah, you can still carry a pen knife, to be fair. I think there is an exemption for farmers carrying Right, knife, right. But, yeah, but I mean, everyone should be able to carry a pen knife. They're, they're very handy. Or well, zombie um, knives. <laughs> I never go anywhere without mine. So <laughs> well, you live in London, very, very wise, Tom. No, exactly. It's just it's personal protection. Um, Josie, before we let you go, we on this podcast, because we're very pro freedom, anti ban, we like to give our guests an opportunity to vent just at the end about something that particularly irks them. So, if you had to have one ban, what would it be? And the only rule is that it can't be worthy. You can't ban a liberalism. You can't ban intolerance. You can't ban asbos, etc. What would yours be? Well, actually, I'm not really annoyed by people very much. I don't mind if they smoke or hold me up um, going up the steps or anything. Um, I would actually ban smartphones because I think they fry your brains and reduce your attention span. So, I mean, I would probably be the least popular person in the whole country, but I think it would be a good thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've I, I certainly uh, banned my son from having one probably ever. Um, well, he, I guess he gets 18 at some point, doesn't he? So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to leave at some point, so you know, then all bets are off. How, how has he taken that, Jersey? Because very well. He's only eleven. He's only, he's only eleven. Right. Well, the so. next few years might be a bit more difficult. Can I ask you, Jersey, why why you're on the line? Because last episode, me and Tom were talking about um, emigrating. I'm pretty much on suicide watch in this country at the moment. The government's <laughs> talking about banning nicotine pouches as well. We haven't even gone on to that. Um, so I need to go somewhere. To be honest, France isn't really near the top of my list, but still, be interested to uh, to hear how it compares on the sort of doing what you like front. I'm half the time in the UK, really, so I'm kind of, I get the, um, the delights of both countries. I mean, Well you know, placed to compare them. <laughs> France is, um, I mean, it's obviously not the place you want to go to escape regulation or taxes. <laughs> but I think it kind of has, it almost has everything in extreme. So it has like a bureaucracy in extreme. And, and actually, uh, during COVID, I discovered a kind of collaborationist spirit in extreme, like the way everyone went along with the vax passes. Oh, well, they are was, big on collaboration. They, well, yeah, exactly. I, I really felt spirit of, of Second World War. And, but it does like extreme revolutionary self-sacrifice as well. So, I mean, when they had the vax passes, every single Saturday in every French town and city, there was a demonstration every Saturday. And people, you know, people went to the wall and I think, so I think that's the kind of the French character is, you know, the state, people also hate the state as well. So like when there are, when there are police sort of stop, stopping people by the side of the road, everyone will flash everyone who's coming that direction to warn them. So if they want to yes. turn off, they can. Sound, yeah. So there's, there's a kind of like, on the one hand, you have this overweening state. On the other hand, everyone hates it and will help each other avoid it. So it's quite nice that kind of, you get the revolutionary and the status elements in quite extreme forms, I think. Mm. Yeah, you don't make it sound too bad. You put it. I mean, it's sunny, it's sunnier to you. I need somewhere that doesn't really, if they're going to have lots of laws, don't really enforce them. Spain? Yeah, that kind of place, exactly. Yeah. Italy, perhaps. Oh, oh, Italy. I wouldn't do that, no. No? Yeah. They really, I mean, well, they really went to town on COVID, obviously. They were, they were mental. I think, yeah, Italian does. Italian... I, think they, I think they disobeyed the law quite a bit. I think they still went around kissing each other, <laughs> which is why yeah. they had an even higher rate of COVID death in Britain. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they um, Italians have bureaucracy and tax, but but nothing works. So in a way, you get the worst of both worlds. Well, at least the French bureaucracy is relatively efficient. I mean, Spain's pretty good. Spain is, is near the top of the list. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Josie. I'll continue my research. <laughs> and, and thank you, listeners, for sending sending suggestions on Twitter. Malta is currently number mm. one in my in my list, but I'm happy to consider other locations. And we will continue well, to revisit this topic. But Chris. Josie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please do take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. And if you'd like to support the show, why not become a Spiked supporter? Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to sign up.
That's spiked-online.com slash supporters.